And joining us now in our book talk segment, great to welcome a man who's written a really fascinating book. It's called The Empire of Deception. It's the incredible story of a master swindler who seduced a city and captivated the nation. We'll find out about it. We're joined today by a journalist. He's also a professor of journalism up in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dean Job joined us by telephone. And uh, Dean, good to talk with you. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, good to have a chance to chat with you. Before we get into the book, I, I have to say, uh, my mom was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So uh, may maybe, maybe we're family somewhere along the line. <laughs> we might. We'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to check that out. N Newfoundlanders originally, and then they were coming to America, and then she was born there. So good to talk to a fellow uh, Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Interesting story uh, about uh, a man that uh, I guess you know everybody knows the Bernie Madoff story, but uh, this guy Leo Koritz uh, did this back in what the 1920s—a very similar type of uh, a swindle, wasn't it? Well, I call uh, Leo Koritz uh, the Bernie Madoff of the 20s. Uh, he was this incredibly successful uh, Ponzi schemer, uh, kept his scam afloat for an unprecedented 18, 20 years, uh, which only Madoff could rival, and. Uh, um, was uh, this great, I, I call him the greatest American swindler you've never heard of. His story had been lost, and uh, I made it my business in the last number of years to uh, find that story and tell it. Now, was he the guy that they made the uh, the uh, the Broadway show about in the movie a few years ago, Catch Me If You Can? I'm not, was that about him? No, uh, Leo's story has never been told. It hasn't. Before. Okay, I thought uh, it might have been about uh, that, but all right. Uh, yeah, well, a similar kind of story of, uh, of just this charming, uh, successful con man who, uh, uh, well, in Leo's case, he didn't have to evade the law until it all fell apart. He was so slick that no one caught on for all those years that uh, he was conning his family, his friends, his uh, circle of uh, business associates, everyone who dealt with him. Uh, he had them convinced he had a, a valuable property in Panama that produced timber and wonderful returns. And then when he needed more money to feed his Ponzi scheme in 1921, he decided to discover oil on the property, which set off a real <laughs> investment boom and uh, and millions of dollars poured into uh, what was essentially just a hollow shell of, uh, of this Ponzi scheme, and uh, the rest went to his pockets. And just again, for people uh, you may not aware of that term Ponzi scheme, it's uh, you get people to invest and then uh, kind of the people below you kick up money to you, and that, that's supposed to be how it funds itself, right? Until uh, until it gets too big at the bottom, uh, there's no money left. Well, it's, it's the classic Rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, there's no asset. There was no, no land, no oil in Panama. Uh, essentially, what uh, what a Ponzi schemer like a Leo Kortz does is a uh, uh, new investment comes in. Um, he skims that off to uh, support his lifestyle, and the rest is used to keep older investors happy. So people who get in early are actually getting returns, may even get their money back, but as the, the pool of investors uh, expands, uh, that new money coming in, that's what's fueling any profit. Uh, when it all falls apart, uh, the merry-go-round stops. A lot of people are left uh, to, with uh, nothing, and they lose everything they put in. The thing that's amazing about this, usually these kind of you know, swindlers, uh, they might do it for a year or two, but, but he did it for, what, about 17, 18 years. So he kept it going yeah. a long time. Yeah, and he did it single-handedly. He had no accomplices. He had no company. Uh, Bernie Madoff had a profile on Wall Street and was well-known. Leo was under the radar and uh, very secretive, obviously, because he didn't want people to ask too many questions. <laughs> but uh, that made people feel like they were part of an exclusive club and let in on this secret. And he did sustain this for all those years and uh, uh, never, uh, never had a cause for anyone, even his closest family and friends, never suspected him uh, until it all fell apart, and uh, it was just a mark of how good he was. One of his investors said, you know, it was like religion. It was like a devout following. No one no one ever questioned this man. No one doubted a word he said, even when at the end of it, he was paying, uh, uh, believe it or not, 60% annual interest is what he was wow. paying to lure in investors. It should have been a red flag to everyone, but <laughs> in the early 1920s, the boom that leads to the great crash of 29, um, people believed in him and didn't believe that it was possible for him to create this kind of wealth uh, from his prop. What was his uh, technique uh, you know, to, to get these investors? Did he put an ad in the paper, come hear me speak, or well, how did he go about getting all these people to give him money? Well, this is another feature that, that just is amazing about Leo's fraud. He was so low-key. I mean, he, did, he didn't advertise. In fact, he turned people down. People would try to invest and he would 
send their money back. I mean, people couldn't believe this. And it just made them more desperate to get in. I mean, there were tales of some investors who begged Leo, threw money at him, you know, sent unsolicited checks, begging to be allowed to invest in his stocks. And uh, it just, uh, this sort of negative salesmanship just made people more desperate. I mean, one guy said, you know, by the time I finally wore or thought he was wearing courts down to invest, trusting him or worrying about the the reality of the investment was the last thing on his mind. He was just so glad to be in on this bonanza. And when he was finally found out, uh, kind of ironically, or maybe that's why you got inv- interested in the story, I'd be interested to hear that, uh, uh, why, but he wound up in, in your neck of the woods, right? Up in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, didn't he? Well, in 1923, um, investors are in such a frenzy that some of them I mean, make sense. They want to go to Panama and look at their property, look at their vast oil installations that Leo's assured them are there. As soon as they get on a steamer, he gathers up what money he can, disappears, goes to New York, sets up a new persona as a fellow named Lou Keat, passes himself off as a literary figure, and discovers that uh, there's a, a hunting lodge, a remote hunting lodge for sale in Nova Scotia. So he comes up here, renovates it, uh, lives under this uh, new name and new persona, and one would think uh, a swindler on the lamb would want to stay low profile, but this is where Leo, I guess, decides to take his ill-gotten gains and live life large. He parties like there's no tomorrow. He <laughs> turns his lodge into uh, a great Gatsby-like pleasure palace with all-night parties and hired orchestras and booze flowing and really lives large. I mean, when I was doing my research, I couldn't believe that uh, Lou Keat would actually show up in the press, uh, mention of his various social events. Uh, that's how high-profile he lived under his assumed name. And ultimately, it wasn't the fast living that uh, tripped him up, but uh, through the course of, I guess, the spectacle he was making of himself, uh, there was a discovery of his real name, and once inquiries were made in Chicago, uh, who is this real guy, Leo Koritz, um, this, uh, there'd been a manhunt in Chicago, uh, out of Chicago for about a year, uh, they were able to come up and, and you know, that disc- that uh, led to his discovery and arrest. Yeah, always seems to be the same ending, though, for these people, they, uh, they get uh, they get careless or greedy or or they think they can uh, be above the law, but usually something gets them in the end, like uh, like that, right? A little, a little ego, well, ego gets them. <laughs> well, yeah. Or but Ponzi schemes are doomed to collapse. So I, I think Leo knew it was it was his time was limited, um, and the best he could do was try to get out of town. But uh, you know, it's not the, it's not like the sting. It's not like angling for a big score and everyone leaves town. You know, a Ponzi schemer is really wedded. To the scheme, it can only he can only survive by getting new money and keeping everybody happy. So, um, you know, it's a very specific kind of con, and uh, uh, inevitably. Uh, at some point, it's going to collapse. Uh, Charles Ponzi only managed to do it for nine months. Got the scheme named after him. I <laughs> argue in the book that it, uh, perhaps they should be called court schemes because Leo did it longer and and uh, lasted longer than uh, Ponzi ever uh, could have considered. Yeah, give, give him credit for that at least, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> kept, kept yeah, it going. He was, denied, <laughs> he was denied a little infamy, I guess, but uh, <laughs> maybe the book will restore him to where he, he deserves to be. Well, it's a great story of uh, really one of the, uh, the, uh, the the criminals of the 1920s, uh, lesser known, but uh, a fascinating story nonetheless, called Empire of Deception. We've been talking with uh, Dean Job today. And uh, Dean, uh, give out a website. Can we get a hold of you the book? Um, EmpireofDeception.com. Uh, the book was launched in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. It's available everywhere, uh, uh, online or from your local bookstore. And uh, there's more information at my uh, website and links and uh, a little more the story if you're interested so uh, check it out great dean pleasure to talk to you hopefully can do it again sometime thanks for joining us okay well thank you very much if you'd like to order the book we're talking about please go to dougmilesmedia.com and enter the author's name in the amazon search box thank you for listening please come back soon for more conversations here at dougmilesmedia.com this has been a presentation of doug miles media all rights reserved you can listen to or download previous programs at itunes stitcher.com or doug miles media